Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Meaning of the Minds webinar on Transforming Urban Transport, the Role of Political Leadership. My name is Jesse Hahn. I'm the Executive Director of Meaning of the Minds. Thanks for joining us. We are a global thought leadership network and platform with year-round programming. Our mission is to connect global urban sustainability, innovation, and technology leaders across sectors to share best practices, tools, and solutions. We do that through our blog, citymindy.org, our monthly webinar series, pop-up events, workshops, and conferences. Today we have two presenters. Diane Davis is the Project Director for Transforming Urban Transport, the Role of politi Political Leadership Project, which is um, shorthand TOT POL. She's also the Charles Dyer Norton Professor of Regional Planning and Urbanism and the Chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. <laughs> Dan, I think you have more titles than anyone I've met. And Lily Song is a lecturer in urban planning and design and senior research associate with the TUTPOL project at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And Diane, um, the ball is yours. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Um, we're really excited to be able to present the results of a three-year research project that we've been undertaking here at the Graduate School of Design. You know, already know the title. Jesse's given a good <laughs> introduction and presentation to the theme of the project. Um, this has been supported by the Volvo Research and Educational Foundations, uh, a nonprofit organization that's really interested in increasing our knowledge about uh, sustainable urban transport. And, uh, we're pleased to present some of the findings of this three-year project. As uh, the title of the project suggests, we're really interested in the politics or the political strategies that are behind um, transforming urban transport. I think many of us in this day and age have a good sense of what we need to be doing with respect to making transportation and cities more sustainable, but that there are still many challenges in the implementation processes. Uh, and we have been trying to understand a little more the political actors and institutions and the strategies and tactics they've used to actually introduce change at the level of the city. Um, so another way of thinking about that is we're really interested in the hows of changing urban transportation. Um, the project uh, was called uh, Transforming Urban Transport, so it does raise the question of what is being transformed. Um, in particular, we, it of course will depend on the city and the places we are looking at seven different cities around the world, but ultimately we are keeping an eye open for diff different changes, shifts in mode shares, particularly the move away from private cars to more public transport or more mass transport. We are also looking at things as straightforward but but significant as repurposing streets and really taking, making streetways and sidewalks more pedestrian friendly, moving attention again away from cars. So overall, and we are looking at many different um, policies around the world, we are trying to understand the transformation of mobility patterns for sustainable urban futures. futures. Now, the question emerges as to, well, what do we mean by transformative policy in all the th cases that we're going to be discussing today? And we're going to be talking about New York City, Seoul, Korea, and Stockholm, Sweden. But in all these cases, as well as the other cases in our project, we have found that there are three different pathways of innovation. Um, sometimes all three are pursued. Uh, in some of the cities, it's only one or the other, but we have grouped these in three categories of software, which, which focuses on regulatory reforms and institutional redesigns that increase accountability and align us incentives for giving better transportation services. Then there are hardware changes having to do with the physical changes in the city, and that could be something as broadly cast as bus exclusive corridors, articulated buses, changes in the streetscape, particularly for traffic calming. And then third, and this is an important element, is the financing. 
looking at innovations in financing that allow us to understand how cities get transformed to be more sustainable. And financing innovations would include congestion charging uh, and integrated transit fares, and those are two of the policies we're going to be talking about in, in more detail. Now, I just maybe I don't need to underscore uh, why it's, it's important to look at the politics of transforming urban transport, but I think that those of us who are on the front lines of trying to introduce change and make cities more sustainable understand that there are a lot of political obstacles and there's often a lot of op opposition to sustainability measures, changing measures such as putting a bike lane in, in a city that's dominated by cars. So we just, you know, start from the perspective that this is an against, you know, an uphill battle often in most cities. Even if you have a large number of transport experts, even some politicians in government and citizens who might be supporting transport, there's often a lot of opposition having to do with the cost of making change, the fact that gains are uncertain, people sometimes don't like change at all. Sometimes the social or sustainability objectives clash with individual priorities or liberties or preferences. There are vested interests involved in, in like the provision of transport, and all these are issues that we found in all the cities that we looked at. So we have a total of eight TUTPOL case study cities. Um, they are all democratically governed major cities in regions with populations between 2 and 20 million uh, people. Um, they also reflect different political conditions, and so the cases that we've selected for today, New York, Stockholm, and Seoul, represent um, the variations. Uh, New York being an American city, um, you know, in a federalist system with greater, historically greater state and local autonomy and private sector um, leadership and public goods and service provision. Um, Sweden being uh, um, more politically and administratively centralized. Um, and South Korea um, being a newer democracy with direct elections uh, since the 1990s. So um, in New York, in terms of the, the pathways um, of innovation, I'll go through the software, hardware, and, um, uh, and financing aspects. So with software, um, Plan YC was the city's first long-range plan. It was uh, completed as a multi-agency process with input from civic leaders and business leaders. The DOT also completed its um, first ever strategic plan under um, a new transport uh, commissioner, um, Sadiq Khan. Um, there were prototypes and trials, which we'll go into further later. But um, the hardware, which is the the physical aspects of the changes. Um, since 2007, the D New York DOT converted more than 40 acres of city streets into uh, 70 pedestrian plazas and 400 miles of interconnected bike lanes. They, these started off with um, cheap makeshift materials and like paint and planners and removable street furniture. For financing, the city partnered with Citibank and Motivate to privately finance and manage bike share as a for-profit unsubsidized initiative for the plaza um, chain for the pedestrian plazas they structured competitive application processes for business improvement districts and other neighborhood based organizations to actually plan and maintain the plazas with support from uh, community boards and from the Department of Transport. Um, now I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we were looking at, what was transformed in Stockholm, and I want to say about the kind of ordering of the presentation. We'll say I'll say a few things about Stockholm, then we'll say uh, a few things about Seoul, give you some summaries, and then move into the strategies and tactics. But we wanted you to have an idea of exactly what was what were the transformations that we've been studying. Uh, in the Stockholm case, it was a really exciting uh, focus for us because Stockholm is one of the few cities around the world that was successful in introducing a congestion charge, and that was the main focus of our attention. So the innovation really was the, a software change in that Stockholm was able to introduce a road charging system that um, was funded as a national tax and then turned into a revenue redistribution screen, scheme. So in order, so that was the kind of the policy software, software policy regulatory shift. 
it also entailed hardware. There was a lot of uh, uh, building of transponders, number plate recognition. They also changed uh, some of the uh, pathways in and out of the city and the, a new ring road around Stockholm as a consequence of the in introduction of the congestion charge. And then also in this particular case, the financing element is, is interesting in a way because the innovation was an effort to create new, fi new resource streams for further financing transportation. So um, it wasn't even so much that w new revenue streams were needed to introduce congestion charging, but precisely the opposite. The introduction of congestion charging had a great impact on reducing cars, um, helping the environment, and also generating a new financial resource for the city. In Seoul, the, the policy transformation that we studied was highway demolition and um, the renewal of an urban stream that had been uh, buried um, and covered with uh, roads and also the overhaul of the bus system and integration with um, the subway system and other surface transport modes via smart card. And so in terms of software, uh, Mayor M.B. Lee uh, established the uh, Office of Chung Chun Restoration and a corresponding research center to draft a new master plan um, for this downtown, um, th this historic downtown area. So they were really trying to spatially prioritize this downtown um, instead of outlying uh, suburban areas. And um, they also, uh, the deputy mayor restructured the, the transport bureaucracy, creating a transport improvement task force to spearhead bus system overhaul while leaving day-to-day -day management to career bureaucrats. And this um, quasi-public bus system that resulted integrated 57 bus companies, 368 bus routes, and, and uh, with operating licenses for the companies and public bidding to award the franchises to operate uh, 19 median lane buses. In terms of hardware, of course, there was the highway demolition and enhancement of the pedestrian environment. Bus system overhaul consisted of establishing uh, bus priority lanes, replacing the aging bus fleet, integrating bus fares uh, with the subway system, and implementing this first uh, prepaid smart card for all trans uh, surface transport modes. Um, for financing, um, they, they uh, worked with the French advertising company, J.C. Deco, to cover the cost of stations for, um, I think it was 15 years of advertising rights. They also worked with um, LG, a domestic company, to form a public-private corporation, the Korea Smart Card Company, 34% uh, percent owned by the city to develop and run the new fare validation equipment on buses in exchange for getting 1.5 percent of each transaction. But they also needed a uh, public subsidy to make things work. Um, the city paid 25 percent to bus operators um, to compensate for, no, no, it was 25 percent for the um, the fleet replacements, and then the national government um, paid for, what was it, 55%, and then the operators themselves paid 20%. And then for bus operators, they also um, got compensated for potential losses, and um, as a result, the cities had to double the subsidies since they started these initiatives. So uh, in terms of the uh, the three cases that we're looking at today, um, to summarize the sort of main um, decision makers and why they undertook the changes. Um, so when we set out uh, with our initial research aims, we were looking at the role of political leadership. What we soon found out was that it was rarely about a single charismatic leader spearheading the changes in these cities. Um, of course, there were leaders who played a strong role, but they weren't the only um, actors in each story. So New York, we had uh, Mayor Bloomberg, um, and then he worked with his deputy mayor for economic development and reconstruction, Dan Doctoroff, and the New York DOT Transport Commissioner, Jeanette Sadiq Khan. Um, and you can see a relationship often between who was spearheading the changes and why. And so um, in New York, it was very much about maintaining the city's global competitiveness and economic growth um, and investing in infra urban infrastructure to um, fulfill these aims. Um, in Stockholm, 
the Green Party played a leading role, as did um, the city council and the was equivalent, I guess, in English, the mayor, Annika Billstrom, and we'll go a bit further into the actual story and the dynamics, but the multi-party dynamic and the fact that multiple governments um, were, multiple levels of government were involved meant that the, the transport policy that was introduced um, had to meet the needs of um, competing parties. And um, in Seoul, of course, it was Mayor um, Myung-Bak Lee who played a leading role and the national government um, as well. And it was to promote a new version, a, a new urban and transport, a new urban and economic development um, vision that centered on this historic um, downtown. And it was also about global competitiveness. So um, it may have also related to Mayor Lee's presidential ambitions. So let's see. Um, so what we want to do now, and I know we're running out of time because the cases are so complicated, we want to say a little something about the kind of the how, how these uh, these great transformations occurred. You know, so not just why the economic development orientations of competitive competitiveness of course is an important element but like a lot of cities want to be globally competitive but how you know if they have a certain vision transport vision for achieving that how can they get that done and we're going to go through as rapidly as we can we have them written hopefully well articulated on the slides and then also we want to underscore that the longer case studies are available on our website and when we end the webinar we can make that available to everybody but there were five things that we thought were really um, important in, in understanding how these political strategies were successful or what the political strategies were these are five things about timing about how the issues were framed about which stakeholders were brought um, in the front stage versus kept at the backstage uh, how the authorities interacted with a technical team as well as how um, in each case uncertainty was reduced by using prototypes and trials. These are five elements that we found across all eight of our cases and we're just going to say very briefly a little bit about the use of these different strategies and tactics in the, the three cases we're discussing today. So the f first one is the issue of timing, how you, um, that you had a series of political actors that, that were able to assist when the moment was right to push an issue. Often that's produced by a crisis or it could be a political atmosphere, triggering opportunity is what we call a crisis. But ways in which sometimes it's, it's, you know, the public mood is going to be open to a new transportation policy and sometimes it's going to be closed. Um, so in the case of Stockholm, uh, oh, 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 yeah, go to New York City, sorry. Okay, so in New York, um, there was a sense of political urgency in 2008. Um, congestion charging was opposed by the outer boroughs and nearby suburbs, so they didn't pass uh, the Democratic caucus to get to the state assembly. And meanwhile, it's the Bloomberg administration's uh, second administration. Uh, the clock is ticking. It's the, the sec end of the second term, and so um, they were looking to do something that the city can could really accomplish without support from these um, outlying suburbs and boroughs. Um, the triggering opportunity was this plan YC, the comprehensive um, plan, the long-term plan. The there was a new DOT commissioner, Sadiq Khan, had just come on board with public sector and private sector experience. Um, there was also existing civic activism by transportation alternatives and other um, groups. And um, there were also models from Copenhagen, you know, where they promoted cycling and walkability and Paris Plage and Belize. In the Stockholm case, it was actually a really um, complicated and very fascinating case study in that um, the mayor, Annika Billstrom, that we mentioned earlier, that was really the, the figurehead behind pushing forward uh, congestion pricing, had run on the um, on her pl her platform for mayor. She had run in opposition to congestion charging because the more conservative parties in Sweden were really opposed to this kind of management of and the reduction of automobile usage that would hit their constituency, hurt their constituency in the suburbs. So it was a very contested political atmosphere. But ultimately, um, when the 
the Social Democrats won at the, at the city level, they also won at the national level, and there was a triggering opportunity as well as it's some sense of kind of support and obligation from the national party to support the new, uh, newly elected mayor, Annika Bildstrom, in pushing forward the congestion pricing. In Seoul, there was it, voters were tiring of the negative effects of the quickly, quickly development style um, of Seoul in South Korea. There was a collapse of a bridge, um, Songsu Bridge, in uh, across the Han River, and a huge department store, which revealed the corruption, uh, systematic corruption by engineering and construction firms and politicians. Um, so people were tiring of the developmental regime. By the late 90s, the bus industry was flailing, partly due to private motorization, but also subway expansion that was um, kind of making the bus lines redundant. And then after um, losing the first mayoral election, Mayor Lee visited Boston and he saw the big dig and saw that how it was advancing environmental and economic goals. Um, in Seoul, he met with researchers or officials at the Seoul Development Institute as customary, but he also um, connected with scholars and activists who were advocating for highway demolition and looking for an alternative for the um, for a highway demolition. Um, his aides um, pointed him to uh, BRT in Curitiba, where he visited, and then they invited uh, the three-time mayor Lerner to visit and visit Seoul. So the, those, those, those were the timing elements. Now in terms of framing the issues, I think there was a lot of creativity and thinking about change in ways that would be appealing to the constituency in all three of the cities. So this slide just underscores the way in which a lot of the changes in New York were not framed um, about kind of, uh, you know, in transport terms, but more livability terms and global competitive terms. In Stockholm, it was very clear that a lot of room for maneuver could be established to talk about congestion charging as a revenue raising measure that would also allow investment in infrastructure even for cars. So that was emphasized much more than the idea of reducing congestion. And then in Seoul, the issue of redeveloping the downtown, restoring the stream, reinventing Seoul, there was a very strong environmental movement in Seoul. Rather than thinking about the issue or talking about the changes in the context of highway removal or even bus re restructuring. It was really um, a, an effort to talk about all the positive things that would happen if the transport change, changes were going to be successfully introduced. Okay. So um, in addition to framing, the proponents of the change policies across this, the cases were very um, skillful in assessing and enabling different stakeholders. So in New York, um, there were a number of opponents. Uh, we mentioned the regional opponents, but there were also um, neighborhood-based opponents, including um, businesses, property owners who feared a loss of parking or loss of business or um, increased congestion, and also some who feared gentrification effects. And um, the Bloomberg administration and um, the DOT were, so they partnered with civic organizations and advocacy networks along with uh, neighborhood organizations um, to actually counter the opposition but also implement the programs. Um, and with the bids in particular, because it was the business improvement districts working with the community um, boards to plan for and maintain the plazas, they kind of, um, they mediated a lot of the neighborhood-based opposition. Um, and one of the things that Sadiq Khan did was actively reach out to the civic organizations like TA, uh, Transport Alternative, and ask them to work with the city before they had mostly criticized what the city wasn't doing, but now that they were trying to do that, um, TA actually helped raise money and bring in Jan Gale, um, you know, raise the visibility of DOT efforts through blog and, and so on. In 
Stockholm. In the Stockholm case, again, you know, there's a lot of details and we want to be able to get to some of the other, you know, follow through with all the slides. But I just wanted to say in general, when we're talking about assessing stakeholders in all these cases, I really, uh, another way to think about this is um, successfully framing and pacing reform efforts so you can broaden coalitions of support and and manage opposition. Mm -hmm. So in order to be able to understand who are your potential supporters and who are your potential opponents, that's where we use the concept of assessing stakeholders. In the Stockholm case, and it was an extremely complicated case, and I should mention that the congestion charging policy in the 2000s that was introduced and then ultimately enshrined in 2007. Um, the policy was first um, put seriously on the agenda in 2002, but it came after 10 years or so, or even more, of discussing ways of using revenues for financing infrastructure as well as efforts to reduce congestion in Stockholm. And so there had been a long discussion among all the political parties for for several decades about uh, the kind of value of congestion charging, the, get, the positive and negative implications of making those types of policy transformations. So the, in the, the administration of Annika Billström was able to find coalitions within her own party and create allies in the environmental movement and other scales of government to, uh, to support congestion charging as well as bringing private sector actors in who would be involved in the hardware of congestion charging. In Seoul, uh, the opponents were within the national government, but also at the neighborhood and industry level. And nationally, Mayor Lee, he spoke to desires among, um, so the, the um, National government is was a bastion of the uh, opposing Democratic Party, and so he really spoke to some of the leaders' concerns to support local autonomy as well as environmental aims. He also exploited intra-party divisions to gain approval for highway demolition and federal funding for bus service enhancements. Um, at the neighborhood level, he um, well the the city created different sort of um, task forces and consultation venues, Council of Merchant, Merchants, Citizens Committee on Chungit Stream Restoration, and so on. So these were sort of quasi-public stakeholder consultation venues, and then also enlisted high-profile supporters to write off eds and publicly defend the project whenever um, different projects came under question. And they also pursued, so they combined both public and private engagement. So Privately, they also negotiated with the affected merchants and vendors and um, bus companies. So the last uh, set of issues before we summarize that is the is the question of technical expertise. Um, I think that uh, uh, Lily's going to talk about the New York case, but the important thing here is often that we think that if you've got a political coalition or political leaders involved in a policy, that it stays in the domain of politics and you kind of sideline the technical and professional experts. But in all these cases, there was a series of conversations and integration of technical expertise into the framing as well as the, the public discussions of the policies. And we're going to go through those very quickly. Yes. Yeah. So in New York, what was special about their use of polling data was that they found out um, that, that they could do congestion charging so long as it supported public transport investment. So it was really marrying polling data with policy feasibility. Um, in doing the Times Square um, plaza changes and the street changes, the traffic changes, um, they combined Jan Gale's um, understanding of how people use the city streets with GPS data from cabs and from DOT um, staff members, which the GPS data from the taxi cabs being more um, politically sort of neutral and palatable. And then later on, they also tapped into transportation alternatives, um, their ability to draw on polling data to um, show that these policies were working, but also that, um, that voters were supporting them because they promoted safety. And then they used that finding to get the de Blasio administration to take these up as, as their own so that these policies would continue. In the Stockholm case, uh, remembering that the mayor came in 
um, in a way to have to reverse yourself on congestion charging and to try to push forward uh, an experiment with congestion charging, it became really important for her to make sure that this experiment was one that would could be pulled off without any hitches at all. And this was extremely important in the success of the congestion charge, which actually started as a trial. And then r residents of Stockholm were allowed to vote afterwards on whether they wanted uh, congestion charging. So the focus on making sure that the operating system was perfect and without flaws took about four years, but all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed with respect to bringing the top professional experts, not just planners, but also technology people, IT people, people involved in kind of monitoring, monitoring um, car traffic, uh, another congestion charging uh, experiments around the world to help them move forward to have a very successful trial. And in the Seoul case, what was novel was not that the mayor engaged the Seoul Development Institute, but that he took the findings and made and operationalized them. He worked with experts, but they really drew on their sort of high profile, you know, their, their profile and their ability to shape public opinion. So basically, as I was alluding to in the Stockholm case, that was a, that was a particular um, clear example of offering an experiment. Mayor Billstrom actually said, we're going to just it's going to be a trial and we'll see how the public responds and if you support it, we will we will we'll put it for a referendum and then we'll decide whether it's going to be introduced into legislation. Um, but we found that in all three of our cases that political actors trying to promote their desired policies used prototypes and trials, kind of a trial by error, not always at the scale of the entire city as happened in Stockholm and that's why the expertise was so important, but even prototype um, bus lanes in Seoul or in the New York City prototype or interim pedestrian plazas that could be returned back to other uses um, just in order to both assess public opinion as well as generate some support for these ideas. So prototyping a trial was very important in the successes of all of our cases. So now we want to just kind of summarize, uh, we'll leave two more slides about the kind of the lessons that we've learned so far with these three cases and the rest of the, the, the other five cases. And that, that's just to get back to our points about the assessing when the moment was right to really disrupt things and to try to do something different. To frame and often reframe once, you know, with data, with polling, with experiments, prototypes, you got responses that allowed um, promoters of policies to frame and reframe the issues so they could continue to broaden a coalition of support. Looking at the opponents and supporters, the critical stakeholders, using a powerful technical team and reducing certainty. So what we would like to end with, what we think are some of the actionable lessons that we learned, but of course we're interested in your questions as well. But um, just taking a step back from these very important and successful policies, it was clear to us that sometimes the initiating objective behind a very successful transformative transportation policy is not always transportation. It could be economic competitiveness, it could be responding to environmental concerns, and that transportation policies become the means and not always just the ends of the transformations in policy that we've studied. We saw that um, disruptive and incremental policies can lead to change. Uh, and often they both are happening at different moments in a, in, a, um, in a process. In the Stockholm case, it was a very long, drawn-out conversation about road charging over decades, but that was kind of put on the agenda with kind of a disruptive election uh, and then, you know, led to an incremental change uh, over time after the a successful experimental trial. Then path dependency matters. We're not saying that a political... Magic can happen all the time. People are constrained by debates uh, of the past. They're constrained by uh, controversies of the past about policies, and they're also constrained by kind of other conditions, financial conditions, and investments of the past. Uh, we found that conflict as well as co collaboration can be good. 
for, for introducing policies because sometimes conflict allows you to have an open discussion in the public so the public can see a little more what's at stake behind policies. And also we found that sometimes that closed negotiations before policy became um, openly discussed allowed you to eliminate some of the most divisive or deal with some of the most con controversial issues before the real larger discussion about whether it was possible to move a policy forward actually hit the public arena. So now we'd like to open it up for questions. Um, and if anybody, here's our, our website. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to take it down. And if you want to look at the longer cases and see more about this project, please do either, you know, contact us or take a look at our website. We also have very short case briefs that summarize each of the cases. Great. Thank you, Diane and Lily. That was fantastic. And I know we could have a five-hour webinar on all these case studies, so it's good to look at those short case studies on the website. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions that have already come in, so we'll transition now to our Q&A. You could please type your questions into the questions panel on your control panel on the right. Um, and we will um, have a, a, about a 20-minute Q&A now. So um, Chad White has a question, Diane Lilly. Um, can you say a little bit more about how you arrived at your analytical framework? For example, you mentioned that you started with an assumption that the presence of a charismatic leader might explain differences among cities. Um, you seem to have decided that while a mayor is important, that was not as significant a variable as your first thought. What changed your mind about this, and what would you recommend that people look for to help them move away from the one quote one great person explanation of history and system change? Great question. Um, I think that the first thing I would say in response is one of the wonderful things about this project we the the generous funding that we got from from the Volvo Research and Educational Foundation allowed us to do a really deep dive into each of these cases. We had field workers both from our team in Cambridge and from those cities working over six to nine months in interviewing and talking to people. So the first thing I would say is the deep dive, in, dive into the reality of how the decisions were made and pushed forward moved us right off the focus on an, an individual charismatic leader right away. Um, and in fact, sometimes leaders like to take credit for these decisions, but they're kind of, they come in at the end uh, and, and grab the uh, credit, but they weren't necessarily the first actors that, that pushed the agenda. So we found that through the deep analysis of, of the cases. Um, and how I, I, let me just say that for those of you who are in the public sector or the private sector working in these worlds and you want to push forward an innovative new transportation policy, there's no replacement for understanding the history of conflicts and relationships among actors within the bureaucracy, um, uh, not just elected officials, but also civil servants as well as civil society and try to understand the kind of relationships and alliances and compromises that have been uh, forged in order to move a policy forward that then a, yeah, a charismatic leader can take credit for. I think also the fact that these cases are all in democratic context means that there's multiple governments involved. New York was kind of rare in that they just focused on these um, street repurposing and, and the urban streets initiatives, but most of our cases had different levels of government, they had different sectors involved, um, they took a substantial amount of time which stretched across different administrations so that it was more than a single individual. Great. And Chad has a follow-up question. He, was, um, he said you used the term quote, political leaders during your presentation that seems that you might be using this as a synonym for a government official rather than a more stakeholder or coalition-based model of a political leader as someone who might help frame a narrative or galvanize a coalition. Is that right, or did you have a different model in mind when you said political leader? Well, I mean, I think another great question, Chad. Um, I think that there are, we don't think that, the only political leaders are elected are government officials. Um, I think in all of the stories, and we, we had to really gloss over the stories here around looking at the strategies and tactics, 
but in many of the um, cases there were NGOs or civil society organizations that were really involved in advocating for these policies and I would say that they, they're in that case we had a kind of distributed political leadership a shared project um, I think that when you're talking about policy you obviously have to be talking about governing officials because it's not just a social mobilization or social movement. If you want a policy enacted, you need to bring get involved the actors who put it on the legislative agenda. But by no means are the only political leaders uh, in the story the ones who are actually at the end point of putting it on the legislative docket. There are organizations, Transportation Alternatives was very involved in in the case of New York, in the Stockholm case, it was a very heavily organized and and very um, assertive environmental movement. Uh, we didn't talk about the Los Angeles case, which was one of ours, but there's a there was a um, coalition of unions and bus riders and other folks involved in in a movement called Move LA or an, an and an organiz a multi-sector organization called Move LA that was really important in pushing for transportation um, advances. So uh, we stopped talking, even though the title of the project is The Role of Political Leadership, we, we are really looking at political actors and institutions, and they are, all, they are in the public sector, uh, the private sector, we did study Uber, and so in the case of Uber, the private sector were, were heavily involved in the political leadership of the transforming regulations for Uber in San Francisco. So public sector, private sector, as well as civil society. Great. And actually that segues perfectly, Dan, into a question from Alex Frank, who asked, how might shared transport like Uber and Lyft change the policy equations? Maybe you can share a little bit about the San Francisco case study or just what you've seen around shared mobility uh, or mobility as a service in other cities that you've studied? Right. Um, well, I think that all of us in the transport field are kind of um, priming ourselves to kind of start un undertaking more serious research about the implications of uh, innovations like Uber and Lyft not just for transportation and mobility, I think a lot of people are understanding what it does to transportation and mobility. It makes it more flexible, uh, but it also can produce, um, you know, inequalities in where these services go. So there's a lot of open questions and debate. Obviously, we're still seeing conflict between regulators uh, um, and the taxi industry and cities around the world in the United States and around the world. But what I think that we don't know yet, which um, we're thinking about here at this project as are others, is what are the implications of transportation, these transportation changes for the kind of growth and structure of a city or the nature of urban land use, which we cannot forget is also a part of the sustainability um, question. So will innovations like Uber and Lyft really, for example, reduce car ownership? Will it change the sprawl of areas? Will it bring mass densification and, more, and support for more mass trans, transit? I think that there are a lot of open questions. Having said that, I think maybe the reason um, Alex asked about Uber and Lyft, it's an it's a ex extremely fascinating case. We were kind of in there. We were, I think, one of the first people to do an in-depth case study of how um, Uber was successful in San Francisco, and then they kind of set the, set the agenda for other cities to try to struggle through it, maybe with less success than in the San Francisco case. This is an interesting story where it was successful because the mayor of San Francisco was very cognizant of the fact of the branding or the identity of San Francisco and supporting the innovation economy was an important part of his political agenda, even though the support for Uber uh, as uh, changing regulations that would harm the taxi industry hurt his own coalition. Um, his own political coalition of governance and how he was able to kind of um, meet his more larger political governing agendas with respect to the IT sector was to bounce a lot of the decision making up to the level of the state. In other words, he effectively moved it out of his own political backyard to another backyard that made it easier for that to be um, supported. And I'm not sure that case, 
that can be done in all the cases that are dealing with Uber. So I think the question is still open with respect to the rest of the United States and the globe about whether Uber will be continue to be as successful as it has been in a few cities here in the United States. Yeah, and I guess the latest with Uber of driverless driverless Ubers in Philly on the road before federal driverless car regulation is ready is is also might be your next case study, Diane, and really, yeah. um, move, you know, uh, moving moving forward without a regulatory framework in place might be an interesting next case study. Um, so a couple questions of whether people can access the PowerPoint and the recording of the we recorded the webinar and we will post the archive recording on our event page at CityMinded.org um, as well as the PDF of the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is already available actually in the handouts panel at the bottom of your control panel, the second to bottom, um, so you can download the PDF already. So some more questions, and a lot of questions coming in. One from Molly Graham um, related to Sweden, case study. What were key elements of the conversation with the suburban, more car-dependent population? Did they remain opponents to congestion pricing, or was it mixed? What were the key messages around um, around that with the suburban car dependent neighborhoods? Yeah, that's a really great question, Molly. <clears throat> I mean, that was the stickler. That was the, where the kind of political parties divided about congestion pricing. And even Anak Bilstrom, the mayor who did the trial, and um, was opposed to it because of her concern about not being elected in by the suburban voters. Uh, so what happened was when after there was some skillful uh, str strategic action being undertaken by uh, Mayor Bilstrom, it, it was not just doing an amazingly um, in-depth and successful trial with all the right things done and no no kinks at all, but in the referendum that they laid out, the referendum was given to people only in the city of Stockholm, not in the suburbs. And the other parties called fall about that. But ultimately, what happened after the trial was that the there were a lot of pictures about how the congestion situation transformed immediately the, the, the day after congestion pricing was um, introduced. Uh, and that ultimately, and I think ironically and in some unexpected ways, made it easier for suburban vo drivers to come from the suburbs into the city to work. So they didn't realize in the opposition originally that there may be some gains for them as well. In some of our interviews, we found people, suburban voters, saying, well, they were willing to pay a little more. They also had probably more income because some of the wealthier suburbs of in wealthier areas in the Stockholm uh, region are in the suburbs. They were willing to pay more to have um, more congestion. And the irony, I would just underscore, and it's all told in the case study, is that after the successful trial and support in the referendum, in the election, which took place six months after the referendum for the next government, uh, the Social Democrats lost. In other words, Annika Billstrom lost after the successful trial, but the new conservative party, it was a liberal conservative alliance that came into power, then promoted congestion part charging, even though they had been opposed to it before Annika Bilstrom came in. So they they also switched their position, and they were the party of the suburban voters. So she took and one for was, the team. <laughs> yes, and it was the support, excuse me, I'll just say that the support of the liberals and the conservatives that enshrined congestion charging is, as a national tax. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, great. Another, I mean, Lily, I think, anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. So an interesting aspect of that case was that because congestion charging passed, the referendum, um, the voters were overwhelmingly in support of congestion charging. But at the same time, the center right alliance prevailed in that election. So they they were bound to kind of uphold congestion charging, even though they had spoken against it until that point. And what they did was they sort of reframed congestion charging as a financing mechanism for regional urban in, or regional transport infrastructure investments. So essentially these revenues would pay for roadway improvements and and some mass transit. But um, they, yeah. so they sort of contradicted their previous position, but they also aligned it 
with their stance to promote um, urban growth. And I can also add one more thing, Jesse. I think that's interesting too. In the, this case, is that ultimately the the uh, another reframing that the liberal and conservatives picked up with the congestion charging was to help them brand Stockholm as an innovation or an IT city. It actually later was identified by the European Union as the su sustainability city and that was picked up by the private sector in a big way in Stockholm. Including well, the Ericsson had been involved in the original congestion charging, but they they charging, but they took this kind of new profile, building on the political requisites of trying to follow the referendum, the reframing of congestion charging as an opportunity to have new revenues. Conservatives like the idea of getting new revenues for building infrastructure, but also as a way to highlight the kind of global competitiveness of Stockholm as an innovative. Um, IT-oriented city. Great. Well, that's a great segue to our question from Mimi Scheller, who is wondering about supranational po political atmospheres and triggering opportunities that contribute to the timing and framing of, transportation, of transformation. So I know you mentioned the EU. We also just came out of Habitat 3 in Quito. Do you guys want to say anything about perhaps there's some supranational political, um, you know, trends that push the all all the way down to the local level some new transformations and change well hi Mimi mm -hmm. <laughs> always a tough question you could probably answer that yourself um, so I I think that uh, we haven't really looked at the kind of su super national or the kind of larger um, debates around these transportation issues. One thing that we're trying to do in the next stage of the research is follow, take for example the Uber case and follow it across the different countries where we've also done other research. Because how, for example, Uber is being regulated in Seoul is very different than in the United States. And there really is an attempt to kind of work with the taxi industry in a more positive, integrative way. Paris, there has been opposition completely to Uber. So we are seeing variations um, across the countries that we know with respect to that single policy. I know it's not an answer to the question of super national organa, you know, uh, influence, and I think that that would have some bearing for us on the European European cases we're looking for, we're looking at, which include uh, Vienna as as well as Paris. But I think still with transport, let me just end by saying that with transportation, most of the innovations, well, Stockholm had, there was a, alliances between local government and national government, and that was integrated through the political party system, but almost all the other cases that we're looking at, we're talking about cities, possibly counties, being involved in transportation. Very few places in the world, and this is kind of what globalization is doing to the power of cities, the problems cities are facing, and the institutional capacities, the decentralized capacities they have, are really devolved or scaled down to the city level. It's not even the national level that much involved. So I don't see the super national level as as being relevant yet, unless there are new ways to connect cities directly to supranational global governance agencies that will come out with a position on transport. Transportation, at least the kind of mobility and pedestrian and transit issues we've looked at in this case, is really still a local city, city and region, city and metro region phenomena, and those are the main actors that are involved in struggling over it. And in terms of the actual ideas and templates, of course, there was a lot of borrowing across different contexts. Great. Good, good. Last question from Colin Hain is, um, and I know you guys can touch on this given your case study in Mexico City of BRT. He said, I appreciate the importance of framing the issue. Any specific examples of framing BRT for a skeptical public? Maybe you guys can just share the, the bigger lessons from your BRT case study in Mexico City. Um, well, the framing, the BRT framing and also kind of the reality of that case is that BRT, what I found interesting in the Mexico City case, because BRT wasn't that new an idea, I mean it's like the most, every transport expert is promoting BRT all around the world even though there are obstacles to it obviously, but in the Mexico City case it was basically a, a lever for 
allowing the government to have more control over transportation planning because in Mexico City most of the transportation was privately offered. So the introduction of BRT uh, in, enlarged the state's planning and of uh, the local government's planning and transportation uh, regulatory capacities. And for me the important issue then is how do we ensure that planning authorities or transport experts have capacities to push forward sustainable transport policies. This is my worry about things like Uber because it's really empowering private provision not a provision where the government is really involved in monitoring transportation. With respect to uh, BRT in Mexico City, the negotiations were about where the lines should go and how they should serve the transport needs of the city, and that's what BRT allowed. It allowed greater transport, uh, greater sustainability governance capacity. So my suggestion would be to talk about it in those terms and not necessarily in only mobility terms. Great. That's a good answer for Chris Morphis, who's also asking, he's writing an op-ed and he wants to know if you guys have any advice to jumpstart a new transportation conversation in his town. So. Um, Chris, that was a little answer for you, but also I encourage everyone, if we didn't get to your question, to email Lily Song, whose email is up on the slide right now. Um, you can also contact um, me, Jesse, J-E-S-S-I-E, at cityminded.org, and I can put you in touch with Diane and Lily, but um, everything you need to know is probably on there. Thank you slide right there. So w with that, we have to wrap up quickly. A short survey will pop up once everyone closes their browser, and we really appreciate your feedback. Hope to see you obviously at next month's webinar and on our blog, cityminded.org. If you're interested in attending our Boston Mobility Summit on June 20, 2017, please apply on our website, cityminded.org. And all of our information about our events and resources is available on our website. So with that, with 30 seconds to go, we'll uh, conclude our session for today. But um, Lily, Diane, thank you so much. Some really rich stuff here. And I know this is not this is just the beginning of sharing all of your three years of work. So. We're happy to have you, and thanks so much. Thanks Thank so much you. for the opportunity, Jesse. Thanks, great. We'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Bye. rest of your day.